another analogy here, and it's the playground. Every playground has a bully on it. And, and so this is kind of the demonstration that there's no such thing really as the far right and the far left. One of the things I know about bullies on playgrounds is they never go it alone. The bully always has a couple friends with them. They really do, and this is true in chimp society too. Uh, uh, the, the successful alpha male chimp always has a couple compatriots, and any alpha that goes it alone gets his face ripped off because chimps are vicious. They really are. They'll rip your face off, you piss them off. The, the, the most successful chimps are the ones who make friends and allies. They, they know how to do it. And uh, in, in fact, uh, anytime you see a single chimp that's doing well, you will see them doing things very familiar to humans. One of the things they do, and this will freak you out, is they kiss all the babies. They really do. They walk around and they, they mingle, and when they see a, a, a female with a baby, they pick the baby up and they, they play with it a little bit and kiss it, and then they give it back to them. The, the, the males that don't do that get their faces ripped off. <laughs> they also break up fights, by the way. If um, in, in chimp society, when you have people pitted against one another, they'll, they'll watch for a while from a distance and they'll see, how's this fight going? How's this fight going? Are they going to settle? Are they going to settle? And if they don't settle pretty soon, the big alpha charges in there and knocks them both down and screams at them and moves them aside. So, so uh, a, a real successful leader needs to be a peacemaker, right? Not a, not a, not a problem maker. If, you're, if you didn't, weren't the bully and you didn't have a couple friends, you might still be safe on the playground. If you're kind of popular, and you have a little bigger circle of friends. Now, I don't know if you all noticed this when you were in high school, and I noticed it because I was watching from somewhere out there. I was not in a popular circle, right? Um, that, that little group of people is almost always safe from the bully. Bullies don't pick on the popular kids in the school because they've always got a circle of friends around them. Who do they pick on? Well, that large group of people that are kind of going it alone, that don't have many He's friends, are a little socially awkward, Maybe, maybe they have other friends, but they're all little geeky, weird, small. They all look like natural victims, and the bully goes after them. And let me tell you what the popular kids don't do. Almost never do they stick up for the unpopular kids, okay? And, and I think that's true of politics and society, too. Well, again, what's that? Oh, my son, I don't want to use, I hate using it as an example, but my son used to get picked on all the time by right? uh, yeah. the school, but he was always the tallest one. They always wanted to beat him up. My well, that's a, that's a little that's a little alpha competition there. Uh, it's, it's, it's good if you're big to pick out another big one and take them down so that they'll leave you alone. Oh, well, there we go. So this is how politics works. And the Republicans <laughs> and Democrats, to me, are kind of like the bully and a few of their friends, and then the popular kids on the playground, and they're, and they're all kind of neglecting uh, the, the, the larger group of people who are the, the down and outers. Uh, ideally, social status would correspond with something called competence and usefulness. The more competent you were and the more useful you were, you would ideally move up the social status ladder, and ideally the distance between the top and the bottom wouldn't be all that great. You, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're so important you don't know the people at the bottom, you're too important. And if you're so unimportant that you don't know the people at the top, what incentive do you have to be civil and decent and follow the rules? You, you might have stacked up to the bottom and you might want to just break it. So um, if you're on the left and you've looked right, one of the things you've noticed about the folks on the right is that the people at the very top don't seem to have those two qualities. They don't seem to be terribly competent and they don't seem to do things that are very useful. And so you become a little bit skeptical of the notion that a hierarchy um, is that useful. And, and, and that's a mistake, because hierarchies are incredibly useful, especially if they know where the berries are, or know what time of the year to plant seeds, or know how to protect you from predators. But um, they're not very useful when the only reason you're at the top is because you've got lots of money and power and connections. Well, the people on the right mistake the fact that they have the money and the power and the connections for confidence and usefulness. In the center, there's a similar problem. The people who have risen in the center, the, uh, the neoliberals, if you would, have risen there because they are the, the professional working class and the skilled, the usually organized working class, and they mistake the fact that they're at the center for the fact that they went to school or they got a job skill. 
they don't look around and see how many people went to school and didn't get through the door, or how many people with great job skills aren't getting paid. Okay, so in, in both camps, they imagine that they've achieved something in this hierarchy status based on competence and usefulness, but, uh, and maybe they are competent and useful. I mean, that does happen once in a while. It's, it's, it's good when it does, but quite often it's not the case. And if you're on the outside looking in, you see that and you become skeptical, not only of the far right, but the far left, or the, the center left, or the neoliberal left. And you start to think, that ain't gonna work for me. So you say, which one would work for me? And this is a little, little chimp psychology here. We got the big brain going, and we're trying to imagine ourselves successful. What would make me successful? I could be beautiful. I could be an athlete. I could be an entertainer, an entrepreneur. I could win the lottery. And you know what? Most people could see themselves doing that before they could see themselves going to school, getting a college degree, and finding a great job that will take care of the rest of their life. <laughs> and, and I think that's why we're seeing this resurgence of confidence in the right and lost confidence in the center. Because back in the 50s, 60s, and even the early 70s, the surest way to rise was to get an education. But in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, that stopped happening. We have the most educated class of 20-somethings and young 30s that ever has existed. The, the older, the oldest, the, most of the wealth is held by older people. And very few people realize this, but only, um, I don't know, it's something like, I'm pulling this number right out of my number place. And um, it's something like 20 to 30% of people who are retirement age don't even have a high school degree. Okay, the people who have the wealth are the most likely to not even have a high school degree. At the bottom, 30, like said, 30 to 35 percent of people in those mid 20s and young 30s, they have a college degree, and they can't afford to buy a house, can't afford to buy a car, are afraid to get married and start a family. Many of them are still living at home, and and, and that's because the deal has changed. No longer do you rise through education and uh, and a good job skill, and so you could look at the liberal neoliberal left people who rose because of an education and job skill, and you could say, why did that work for you, and why did it not work for me? And the answer was earlier, the door closed. The door closed. We, and, and the folks that made it in are not particularly worried about changing the rules to make more, let more people in. Good idea, by the way. I'm not against getting an education and a job skill, nor am I against being a very um, competitive and competent, useful entrepreneur business owner. Those are all great things to be. Social says, I just think they're not so well connected today with the amount of wealth and power people have. Okay, liberalism is in the center. Yeah, we, we think liberals are on the left. We, the folks on TV have been telling us that for a long time. Liberalism is in the center. And, and it's not hard to understand why, because the liberals are the revolutionaries. They're the folks who have some hope of beating their way over to the right. They're working together. They're also fierce competitors, and they're and and they also have skills, you know, education. So they're pounding their way in, and they're in the middle. And you'll see where you'll see here in the very middle the word liberalism. And I'll I'll tell you what the landmarks on this are. You see on the left what I call the new left. I I, I, put, I made this about six months ago, and since then um, the new left has been being described on TV. And they're not describing it as where I described it. So if you hear someone on TV say the new left, they didn't steal it from me. They've used it for another purpose. And you see the little red dot in the far lower left corner? Yeah. That's me, OK? That's where I scored on this test. I didn't expect to score that far south or that far left. Um, so I scored just to the right of communism. Anything communism doesn't seem to work for me, OK? Uh, the communists have had their moment, and it, it just didn't work well at all. And anarchism just doesn't seem to work for me. A leaderless society is a society that's doomed to failure. And uh, we'll talk a little bit maybe about those two concepts. But what I really want to stay in is in this sweet spot in the middle. You see, I put a square here, and I call that the sweet zone. It's, it's the zone that's a, a, little, a little bit left, but it goes pretty far right. But we have to pull the reins in on capitalists, because really powerful people don't know any boundaries, and if you let too many people stack up at the bottom, you know what they do. They break it, okay? We can't, we don't want it broken. So
So liberals are the people in the center, and their new focus, having, having made their way in, is to stay in power. And, and that makes them more like conservatives. But they continue to call themselves progressives. And it, what you see on there is that progressives are on the right. What's your question, Joseph? Right. Why is progressives on the right? That's a great question, Joseph. Thank you for asking that. Um, why would progressives be on the right? We've been calling ourselves progressives for years, and we're lefties, right? Yeah. Okay. The, the first some of the first progressives were people like Abraham Lincoln and some of the post-Reconstruction presidents who thought we should take tax dollars and build railroads <coughs> out to the west and connect the west to the east. And that way we could develop the great center of our nation for a stronger economy. And in the process, they hired a lot of people and it did help the economy and a lot of rail barons got very rich. It seems like progressive causes are frequently an excuse to make a lot of money and employ people dressed up as something to help everyone in common. Oh, that's, it's a smoke screen. It's a bit of a smoke screen. And, it, and, and you can enter into this with crony capitalism, which you'll see I put to the right. I regard the Democrats to be neoliberals and the Republicans to be crony capitalists. The Republicans don't want the government to ever stop spending money. How do you think they're going to make profits if the government stops spending money? The, the, the left doesn't want the government to stop spending money either. We've got to keep people going to school, borrowing money for, on loans, um, and having faith in the, in the employment system because their, their best sponsors are the banks, the education institutions, the insurance companies. One of the things you'll notice about the, uh, the neoliberals is they're not excited about anything where you give something away. They'd really rather spend the money on a contract. It, it just seems to be the way. While we think of progressives as something that improves us, and, and that's the way I use the word always, I think of the, of, the, of the liberal class or even farther left as being natural progressives because they're in favor of revolutionary change. That's where revolutionary change comes. It comes from the liberals. The people who feel they have enough power to kind of break a door down and they know they need things that the government isn't doing or they need change and they're ready to do it. But the folks who've already got through the door, they already got theirs. And so what they're trying to do is keep theirs and so they want to throw a little bone out. Well, maybe we can tweak the system and that insurance won't be quite as expensive as it would have been otherwise. Maybe we could pay for a dental visit every four years or something, you know. They, they want to tweak it a little bit, throw a little bone out, and keep the revolutionaries outside the door, and the revolutionaries want in. But I always wonder why these neoliberal Democrats call themselves progressives. It's because they're defending progress that was made in the past. I want to give you an example. They see uh, Social Security as a progressive cause. And once upon a time, the most desperately poor people in America were senior citizens, okay? And at that point in time, Social Security was incredibly progressive. It was great thinking. But at that point in time, people earned enough to save money for their retirement. They don't anymore. So what's the next generation of thinking? If you're in the 60% that can't scrape up $500, you're not worried about a, uh, a supplement, and it's, it's, it's actually insurance, but it's a supplement to your, insur your retirement at age 67 or 70. What you're really worried about is whether you'll even have a place to live in at age 55 and the help to do it, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, so because we've been robbed of the ability, at least 60% of us, to save a little money over the years because we spend it during periods of unemployment or to keep our house from going into hock or send kids to school, at age 67, when, we, when our retirement should have run out and we should be collecting Social Security, we're just now thinking about retiring. So we haven't, start, we haven't changed our thinking about Social Security enough to think of a really progressive answer to the problem so we're calling ourselves progressive just because we want to keep what we've had for 30 or 40 years, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I won't belabor that anymore. So neoliberals think they're progressives and they call themselves that all the time. Now, um, I, I look at this chart and I see that the Democrats, the Republicans, are north of that, of that center line, okay? North of the center line is authoritarianism because some people see the government as the vehicle 
for damn near everything. And if you're on the left, you, you tend to realize that you need government to do certain things in your life. You really need government to manage water. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm big on government owning and managing the water on my behalf. I'm not so hot on the water being privately owned and privately controlled. No. But, yeah, it, it, it seems like a bad idea to me, yeah. right? So, but that's the left. The right thinks everything that's out there is for profit. And then this is true whether you're in the libertarian right or the libertarian left, because, because lefties see things differently in the world. They see the world as a place where we cooperate, not where we compete. And so we're willing to work together to keep the water for not only this generation, but for future generations, because it ain't ours to, in the sense of just who sit in this room. It's ours, all the people who need to live on the planet forever, right? Yeah. So, so, but the right says, boy, there's some water there. I can make a dollar or whatever, and boom, they're off. Okay, and what I really want is the government to get the heck out of my way. Well, not really. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a Republican righty, if you're north of the line, what you really want is the government to give you the water and not let anyone else get in on it. Can I say Nestle? Okay. <laughs> you want a sweet deal. I, I, I swore I wasn't going to say Karl Marx, but someone else said it first, so I'm going to go ahead and say Karl Marx. And Karl Marx had come up with this idea that all, almost all wealth derives from the assistance of the government in capturing something that belongs to us in common and giving a monopoly of it to one of their favorites. And that's the kind of thing that um, the right-leaning politicians and even the center-leaning politicians do. They just want different things. The right wants the water, the center wants the schools and the insurance companies and the banks. Well, they'll share the banks, okay? They'll share them. <laughs> Now, um, you'll see also that the, in the north uh, corner there, you see things like fundamentalism and traditionalism. These are the natural homes of the conservative right. How, have you, how can, in the world can you justify being the, the controllers of servants without a little help from tradition and God? It's the only way it's going to happen. And the left says the only way we're going to get it all back, and this is a big difference between Karl Marx and another fellow named Bakunin, and if you, it, 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 that, that's going to be on the test, Bakunin, Mikhail Bakunin, okay, Mikhail Bakunin and Marx taught almost the same things about economics, but Bakunin says, no more government and everything will work out fine, we'll all just get along, we'll work together, we don't need, we don't need an alpha chimp running around telling us what to do, we'll all just do it on our own. I don't know, I've been in big groups. People don't just do things on their own, I hate to say it. Yeah. Karl Marx said, hey, I got an idea. We've got a government, they've got armies and police officers. We'll get ourselves elected and we will use our power to enforce this, this communism. So what you saw was the difference between an authoritarian kind of communism, which we would call Marxism today, and an anarchist kind of communism, which is Bakunin and his crowd. And we see the same thing on the right. You see, the, you see the, the authoritarian capitalists, which would mostly be conservative Republicans, and then you see the libertarian capitalists would mostly be libertarians today with, with the nice, pretty, dark blue jerseys that I used to wear all the time. I want to share with you, I don't want to go too much further into that. You can look at this, you can go online, um, and, and I do want you to, to share a few of your own thoughts and ask a few questions about this. But before I do, I want to talk just a skosh about my own experience running for office. We, we went into this knowing very well that where we live was very conservative. And one of the things um, that uh, my committee and I decided fairly early on was that we were going to run something that I called the Enough Campaign. I was going to be visible enough that anyone who wanted to know I was a candidate would know. That meant I would respond to the articles in the newspapers. I would, I would write a little here and there. I'd have a big Facebook presence. We'd have some events and promote them. And uh, we would um, advertise a little in the paper, put yard signs out, the kinds of things you got to do. But that we weren't going to spend $100,000 to help a guy get a job that would pay him $72,000. And, and I hate to tell you that, but if you've never been on the other side of a campaign, Anytime there's even the smallest chance of winning, that's how much money they spend. 100K plus is very conservative. 
for a district for a state rep district where they think they might win and so I looked at um, the previous state rep candidates who ran in my district and four years ago a fellow spent a hundred thousand dollars roughly a hundred two thousand dollars and he ended up getting something like 33 percent of the and um, that wasn't exciting after spending a hundred some odd thousand dollars not only that but because I helped him and I, and I knew this campaign very well um, people came in from all over the state they were they had the highest number of doors knocked per day of any district in the state of Michigan and they sent out tons of literature including negative literature positive literature every kind of literature you could imagine advertised in the paper advertised on the radio they really spent out for him to win and he got like 33 percent then I went back four years before the fellow who ran four years before had never run for office a total novice couldn't talk in front of a group of people for all the money in the world. Great guy, would have been an excellent representative if he had got elected, but he just wasn't going to go out and run a campaign. So he, he raised enough money to hire a campaign manager. He spent something on the order of $35,000, and, and instead of getting the 3,300 votes, he got 7,000 and some votes. And I said, well, hold it, hold it. This is kind of inversely proportional here maybe the amount of money you spend on your campaign is less important than just being there and being the person they want to vote for so we spent fifty five hundred dollars on our campaign almost all of it from very small individual contributions from mostly my friends in my group and a few people that were just a little better off and um we actually got more votes than either of the previous two with the smallest amount of money and, and so i'm going to encourage you if you think that that you want to run for office, not to think that you have to raise that kind of money or be in the pocket of any group. You, you can raise enough money if you have seven or eight friends and a willingness to, to be at events, respond to invitations, ask for invitations to, to major events like uh, local forums. You, you can do okay. Now, that being all said, uh, open the floor to questions either about either the, the compass as I talked about or about the campaign. What, what, what did I learn during the campaign that I haven't talked about? Rebecca. Uh, where's populism on this chart? You know, populism's a funny thing because populism's on the right end on the left, right? That's, what, that's the lie you tell people when you want to be popular. Um, and... Uh, or drain the swamp, that's a... Yeah, yeah, whatever whatever it is that will make your supporters happy is technically populism. I've always said that there's nothing wrong with being popular um, at all. In fact, we shouldn't we want our politicians to be popular, but I'd also like them to be honest. Right? That would be good too. Yeah. Uh, so you you uh, came up with the history of the, the word conservative. Mm -hmm. I thought was which I thought was great. It matches it, the uh, the word conservative from uh, an engineering perspective does not match right right well but it is easy to slip into using the word conservative you were talking about money at the very end there using this using using the other definition right yeah so the so the word conservative um has an earlier contextual use and it's the same meaning it really is it's to keep in your service so if you have wheat you don't want the wheat to run out before next spring. You want to keep some of the wheat. And the uh, serve in there is also in observe. You want to keep it under your control and under your observation. So the lady, okay, the lord and the lady controlled the larder. The lady had the key. She kept it right here, okay, where it would be safe. And so she controlled and kept under her observation the beans and the wheat and all the stuff that was in the larder and that too is conservatism but the first use of it to, to define a group of people was the French it was always it always had something to do with keeping things in your control and in your service so, does that make sense yeah. and that's how you use it I'll bet something is you, you design things conservatively when you don't want them to break yeah there you go any righties in the room by the way did I offend anyone I must have offended someone I usually manage to do that I just got one question. Uh, you're talking about uh, your belief in that. A lot of these women who won in November, they didn't put down any 
religion at all. Like, right. So you don't really have to answer that question. Are you religious? Right. I'd rather not answer that. So. Yeah. So. I always I always said for years, even as an atheist, I would if I was a single atheist gay man, I would get a picture in front of a church with a woman, two children, and a dog. Because uh, that seems to be the thing, right? But but um, I'm not so sure that's as important as it was in the 1950s and 60s, because um, uh, the, the the religious right elected a man who was uh, married three times, cheated on all three of his wives, um, and uh, imported them, and and uh, ran a, a a gambling casino and uh, uh, and, and ran a. A beauty contest where he sneaked in and peeked at the girls. I mean, you know, I'm not sure that this matters. Uh, so I think the best thing to do for for men, uh, like myself, is to or you women, is to come just come out of the closet and come clean and be a decent person who's genuine, so that they can say, oh, I see God isn't necessary to be decent and genuine, right? And in fact, there was a fellow here. A few of you will remember. A wonderful convention a few years ago. There were there were three incredible speakers at that convention. <laughs> What's on the internet? It was great. Uh, <laughs> one of them. Uh, um, what was the guy's name? He's a PhD researcher from Mount Pleasant. Um, you remember him very well. Andrew He's, Frank. Huh? Andrew Frank. Yes. No, not Andrew. Yes, Andrew Frank. You're right. Andrew Frank uh, did a study to see um, what hurt you more politically. Uh, being uh, an atheist or being black or being homosexual. And let me tell you what hurt you most was being an atheist. <laughs>